Howdy, and welcome to my big fat Greek vaccine lab rat vlog part two. I feel like the last video or part one, I was a little bit nervous because it's so different from anything that I've really done on this channel before. And it's also politically charged, even though I think it's ridiculous that it's politically charged. It is politically charged. And within, oh, I say five minutes of uploading an eight minute video, I received tons of comments and DMs calling me a shill and an idiot. So let's set the record straight and get a few things out of the way. Number one, if you think I'm crazy, good. I want you to call me crazy, baby. <laughs> I think that if you think that participating in a vaccine trial is crazy, then you'll pay more attention to the results that I have from that vaccine trial and you'll be more familiar with it. So I guess it's good because then I just have your attention if you think it's really crazy of me to do this. I have faith that this vaccine technology will work and it'll work safely. And I'm putting my money where my mouth is, or I guess I'm putting my body where my mouth will be in a year, which sounds like I'm writing a script for a four-dimensional porn. Number two, as for the shill thing, I'm glad you brought that up because I am not going to be answering any questions regarding what company it is that is funding this study or making this vaccine. Mostly because I don't want the comment section and I don't want my subscribers to be full of biotech investors. To my knowledge, all of the stage two or stage three vaccine candidates use the exact same technology and this one in particular will not cost more than $20. Yep, you heard me right. Whether you are a uninsured American living in Los Angeles or whether you are in a third world country and have inconsistent access to healthcare or whether you live in a country with socialized healthcare or single payer system, this will not cost more than $20. That's really important to me and that's a big reason why I'm fascinated with this particular technology and candidate because I don't think that anybody should have to choose between paying rent or being safe from a deadly pathogen. I'm volunteering for the trial, but I am being paid for the trial, but I'm not being paid anything special because of this platform. I'm being paid the exact same thing as everybody else participating in the trial, which is not that much money at all. If right now, somewhere in this video, I convincingly recommended a VPN to you, I would make more than 10 times what I'm being paid for this entire trial. That being said, if you happen to run or do PR for a company that makes top shelf straight bourbon, I'm all ears. All right, so let's get to the meat and potatoes and talk about how this vaccine will hopefully work. Work. And if you're not familiar with my channel, I need to tell you that I am not a doctor and I am not an infectious disease specialist. In fact, that is the one thing I have in common with anti-vaxxers who claim to be doctors or infectious disease specialists. So as you know, there's vaccines for viruses and there's some vaccines for bacterial infections. I'm gonna be concentrating on the viral vaccines. So traditional virus vaccines come in a few different varieties and the OG one and the one that is still the most clinically proven to be effective would be live or attenuated viruses where your immune system is introduced to a weakened form of the disease. It's like offering 50 injured gazelles to 50 million lions. But the downside is that if somebody has an extremely compromised immune system, it could actually make them sick with the very disease that they're trying to prevent. But for those of us with normal immune systems, since you're showing your immune system the real thing, it's actually very effective at creating immunity. Next up, we have inactivated vaccines or dead viruses, and those may produce an effective immune response, but they also require, in a lot of cases, booster shots or multiple doses of the vaccine to keep that immunity going. Next up, we have subunit vaccines, and those are not quite as common, and they're a little bit newer, but they contain part of the virus, and they're missing enough molecules to where the virus is a really far ways off from ever becoming a pathogenic disease again. Subunit vaccines can be extremely effective, but the problem is, is that they take quite a while to produce, and when you're making a new one, it does take a bit more trial and error than the others do. Now, out of all these vaccines, the one that has the highest risk of harming the patient would obviously be the live vaccine, because not every person who's getting vaccinated knows that they may have a compromised immune system. If the patient does have an extremely compromised immune system, that attenuated culture can revert back to pathogenic form and cause disease in the patient. This is extremely rare, but it is theoretically possible in viruses. For bacterial vaccines like tuberculosis, it is measurably common. But when I say measurably common, I mean like 
0.000159% of a chance that this will happen. You are statistically more likely to be injured from a toilet. You are statistically more likely to win an Oscar. You are in fact statistically more likely to die in a fatal car accident on your way to receive the tuberculosis vaccine than you are to contract tuberculosis from a tuberculosis vaccine. So the danger of the riskiest vaccines is absolutely eclipsed by the most conservative estimated mortality rate of COVID-19. They're not even in the same ballpark. But my vaccine, I am getting something new and high tech, of course. It's called mRNA. And long before COVID-19 came around, I was already hearing about this and I was really excited about it because it can do things like create an influenza vaccine. No, not a seasonal influenza vaccine. An influenza vaccine that just makes you never have influenza again, that eradicates influenza. Due to the way it works, it allows us to create vaccines for things that we have previously not been able to vaccinate against, like HIV. And it allows us to manufacture those vaccines very quickly. So what is mRNA? It is a molecule that is custom made with instructions to make proteins. It's stuffed inside lipids so it could slide right into cells. So once this happens, my ribosomes will start making spike proteins based on the molecule's instructions. And those spike proteins will be what coats the COVID-19 virus, but the COVID-19 virus won't actually be inside them. My immune system will see these spike proteins and act as if I've been infected. It'll kick into overdrive and do these two things. First, it'll create a whole lot of antibodies. And since I'm not dying or gravely ill, it is theorized that the antibodies that it will create will be the long-term ones, more so than the short-term ones, which weirdly will actually make me more immune than somebody who actually had COVID-19 and has herd immunity. Second, unfortunately, there's a chance that it will make me feel ill. After all, my immune system will be trying to fight an infection that actually isn't there. So there is a chance that I may feel run down or run a fever for a day or two. And there's a slight chance that I may run a high fever and feel sick a little bit longer, but that shouldn't happen because once the mRNA is processed, then my immune system has no reason to be fighting anything anymore. Whereas if I actually had COVID-19, the virus would still be replicating itself and that fight would still be going on. This may or may not happen. And from looking at the stage one study, it's most likely that it won't happen. I'm going to, I'm about to say something where there's a big chance and I may eat my words in a day or two, but I kind of hope it happens because if it does, then I have a little bit more evidence that my my body is actually creating an immune response to COVID-19 and I don't ever want to get COVID-19. That is the scary monster. There is a chance that my reaction to the vaccine will be scary and unpleasant, but it is a much more manageable monster and it's one that's not life-threatening. I guess we'll see. Like I said before, mRNA vaccines have not been approved by the FDA yet, but they're not that new. They've been tested on humans a whole bunch before. It's actually kind of a good thing that this technology just happens to be emerging right when we're in the worst pandemic of a century. A just as, if not more important perk from a global health perspective of an mRNA vaccine is that they can be made cheaper and much quicker than traditional vaccines because you do not have to create, manipulate, or isolate cultures. Traditionally, that is the most time-consuming, expensive, and labor-intensive part of making a vaccine. Whether it's this mRNA candidate or another one or a combination of different ones that get chosen to be used, this technology may save hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. And that's really good news. And despite the scariness of being a lab rat, I'm actually proud to be involved with this technology's next step. I hope that helped you understand the science that is behind the COVID-19 vaccinations and I hope that made them seem a little bit less scary. If I have time in the next day or two, I actually wanna cover basic reproduction numbers and virus and vaccine statistics because I think that plays a very important role in this. And I'd like to do that before going into portable camera vlog mode where I actually get the vaccine and all that stuff. Believe it or not, I actually fact check every single thing that comes out of my stupid mouth in videos like this, which is why if you haven't yet, you should subscribe to my channel. And if there's anything you want me to cover in the future, or you have any questions, let me know in the comments. 
you should definitely share these videos about the vaccine process because I think it's important to let people know early what they're going to be experiencing a year from now or six months from now or whenever this gets approved and distributed to everybody. It seems weird to even mention music in a video like this, but I am a professional musician. If you like music, you could check it out in the link below. I think I have over 25 hours of music on Bandcamp. It's also on Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. You could also follow my socials. All of that's in the link below. Until tomorrow, later, whenever my next video is, bye.